Ignition sequence starts. Good morning and welcome to this peek inside the International Space Station Flight Control Room at NASA's Johnson Space Center. This is where there's always a team of specialists on duty monitoring the performance of the space station systems and working with the expedition crew members as they move through a daily agenda of science research and space station maintenance. Expedition 66 Commander Anton Shkaplerov and his American, Russian and German crewmates are comfortably in between cargo ship operations and spacewalks right now. They spent this week focusing on science experiments in the station's laboratory modules. Houston Station on Space to Ground. Welcome to Space to Ground. I'm Shneek Varin. The seven members of Expedition 66 kept a busy pace of science all through January, and February is looking to be just as packed. European Space Agency astronaut Matthias Maurer recently printed samples from a handheld bioprinter. Bioprinting is a subcategory of 3D printing, which uses viable cells and biological molecules to print tissue structures. Bioprint First Aid demonstrates a portable handheld bioprinter that uses a patient's own skin cells to create a tissue forming patch to cover a wound and accelerate the healing process. On future missions to the moon and Mars, bioprinting such customized patches could help address changes in wound healing that can occur in space. Extracting an individual's cells before a mission may enable more immediate response to injury. And what else is a buzz aboard the station? The science continues with a beep. Astrobe, that is. NASA flight engineer Mark Van de Heij performed a series of tests for the Rome investigation. Rome uses the space station's Astrobe robots to observe and understand how targets tumble and uses this information to plan ways to safely reach them. Astrobe, NASA's free flying robotic system, is designed to help astronauts reduce time they spend on routine duties, leaving them to focus more on the things that only humans can do. To hear more about Astrobe, catch this week's Houston We Have a Podcast. Eric Ketterhagen, the Spheres and Astrobe Operations Lead at NASA's Ames Research Center, will talk about what's a buzz with these flying robots in space. And finally, outside the station, more science was deployed. A pair of small satellites called CubeSats were deployed outside the Japanese Kibo laboratory module. This release included the Light-1 CubeSat, which focuses on the detection of terrestrial gamma ray flashes coming from the Earth's atmosphere. Another CubeSat developed by the Georgia Institute of Technology has experimental deployable solar panels and a deployable UHF radio antenna. The modest size, cost, and weight of CubeSats like these are increasing access to space and expanding low Earth orbit research. To follow these experiments and for the latest updates, follow along with us on Twitter at ISS underscore research. That's Face to Ground. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week. Each group of astronauts and cosmonauts that completes a long duration mission to the International Space Station spends time on a unique subset of the kinds of experiments that Expedition 66 worked on this week. The astronauts who rode to space on the Crew-2 spaceship came back to Earth recently with their own legacy of work on hundreds of experiments. Here's a look at just some of their accomplishments during 199 days in space. Liftoff, Godspeed Endeavor, and Crew 2. The crew is go for ingress, and you can see <laughs> Aki is the first to ingress onto the International Space Station. We're so excited to be here. We're ready to get to work. There's a lot of uh, great science, and uh, we're just excited to learn and get started. The experiment that's taking up most of my time right now is called Celestial Immunity, and it's a really interesting experiment that involves looking at immune pathways. And I have an expert that's looking over my shoulder via camera, and she can talk with me kind of step by step as we go through the process. That looks good, Megan. All right, thank you very much. I'm sure I'll be talking to you again tomorrow. Yes, you will. <laughs> 
Recently, I've been working on a really interesting educational experiment. It's called the Blob. It's that that uh, crazy monocellular being that has no brain but can learn uh, and can actually search food and solve mazes. It's, it's pretty contained on the space station. Don't worry about it. It's very tiny. Uh, but so we're we're working on all kinds of endeavors like this, and every day, you know, brings its uh, its uh, lot of discoveries on the space station. That's very exciting. We're tracking a full and good deploy of that solar array. So well done, both of you. It is beautiful. We're in a season now, actually, of doing cargo ops. We have two spacecraft that are attached to us that brought us cargo, and now we're packing them back up to get them ready for departure. On board the International Space Station, we do help out some of the development of uh, medicine. Without gravity, you get uh, larger chunks of pure protein crystals. What we're looking for today are needle-like structures. Perfect, there they are. Well, it is a fantastic view that we have. We see the thin layer of atmosphere that's protecting all of you down on Earth. So just taking care of our planet has kind of been a change, maybe mentally, from seeing it from this perspective. We are growing some chili peppers in the plant habitat here in the Japanese experiment module. It's one of the more complicated things that have been grown in space, and so they do take a little longer to come to fruition. So we're really hoping that we get to try some peppers before the end of our mission. Over the years, the capabilities of the laboratory have expanded and grown, along with the interest in doing this kind of research in low Earth orbit, which I think is really remarkable. So we are really kind of at the peak of that, I think. And so we've seen a little bit of everything, right? We've done um, human immune system research, so lots of research into medication formation, um, fluids research, combustion research, even robotics research, this huge range of different things that we've gotten to touch during our mission. And the way science works, as you know, is this is the building blocks for stuff to come. And so the re results from these experiments will come out in the years to come, but they will also be the foundation of experiments that are designed in the following years. And so all of the research is going to be stuff that we get to say, oh, we had a little part of that. We got, we got our hands on a little bit of that, which is a pretty neat feeling. The International Space Station orbits 250 miles above the Earth and the vast diversity of plant and animal life that exists here. Bringing some of those species into the weightless environment has allowed scientists to study them in ways they can't in 1G. And that's led to discoveries about how humans can better survive in space as well as on the home planet. The International Space Station orbits Earth in the cold, solitary vastness of space. But look closer. There's a cornucopia of species bringing the interior of the station to life, and with it a plethora of scientific knowledge contributing to humans learning not only how to survive in space, but thrive both on Earth and beyond the edge of our planet. Animals that fly in the air, animals that swim, squirt, and float in water, animals that creep, crawl, walk, and run on land, all are being studied to learn how they react and adapt to microgravity conditions. Since many share similar cells, tissues, and other organic structures to humans, each is studied for what they can reveal to help astronauts withstand the rigors of long-range space travel some examples. The tardigrade, or water bear, is well known to possess genes that can withstand extreme hot and cold temperatures, dehydration, and radiation. What can we learn from these amazing creatures that might help keep astronauts safer in extreme environments? Astronauts exercise two hours a day and closely monitor their diet. However, the loss of muscle mass that occurs in space is still a serious obstacle that researchers are working to overcome. As such, roundworms were exposed to a microscopic obstacle course to study their unusual muscle strength, while zebrafish have helped researchers develop countermeasures for muscle weakness. Another fish, the Japanese madaka, have helped improve our understanding of the mechanisms behind organ tissue changes. And of course, one of the most common space travelers, the rodent, was found to be more physically active in space than their earthbound counterparts in one experiment. Why?
This matters to scientists who are studying the effect of microgravity on bone loss. Jennifer Buckley is the Deputy Chief Scientist for the International Space Station Program Research Office at NASA's Johnson Space Center. She explains how studying multi-generational organisms can have big impacts on our understanding of both animal and plant biology in space. Fruit flies multiply so quickly, we can observe several generations at one time. We can trace the actual development of an organism from conception to birth to adulthood and old age. And the genetic changes from one generation to another are easy to track. Regarding plants, Buckley says, plants develop differently in microgravity. They don't know which way is down anymore. They no longer have a gravity signal for their root structure. So we examine their RNA to see how it's giving directions and signals and how that differs from the way plants behave on Earth. Many types of plants are grown on the station, from flowering plants to leafy greens to vegetables. What we learn could influence our approach to growing different plant types in the future. Practical benefits for those on Earth have come from studying all these various forms of life in space. Traditional fertilizer can't be used on plants in space, as they're not grown with traditional soil. As a result, NASA scientists, working closely with the private sector, developed a fertilizer that would release its nutrients over a specific amount of time. The process proved to be not only successful in space, it can also be used on Earth in vertical farms and urban plant factories. Life in space is not new. The study of numerous species going back several decades have given researchers multiple views of how life can exist and thrive in the harsh environment of space. Buckley concludes, we'll conduct hundreds of experiments during each six-month expedition. We want to study a broad diversity of organisms that will help us travel beyond low Earth orbit, while also giving us insights that may improve life on Earth. For more information about the multitude of life on board the space station, go to www.nasa.gov slash iss-science to discover more about the space on, around, and beyond our planet. Visit science.nasa.gov. Along with hands-on work on science experiments, International Space Station crew members spend some of their time in educational events in which they talk about science with students on Earth, discussing their mission, and sharing the value of learning about science, technology, engineering, and math. In this demonstration video, astronaut Randy Bresnik demonstrates Newton's second law of motion. Hello everyone, I'm astronaut Randy Bresnik, living and working aboard the International Space Station. Now, on the space station, we live in a microgravity environment. Do you think the laws of physics will hold up? Come on, let's go find out. The acceleration of an object depends on the net force acting on the object and the mass of the object, or F equals MA. Surely good show, Sir Isaac. Here we see that once the force of the thrust is greater than the weight of the vehicle, the rocket begins to accelerate. All right, we're going to start with something small. Something you might have at home. A little stick of chapstick. We'll go ahead and use our force, being our bungee cord here. We'll put it on our bungee, and we'll pull it back. And you can see how fast it accelerates because there's very little mass. Next, we'll try a little spaceship. A little more massive, and you can feel that because as you move it, you can feel that the, the kind of the force, the extra force you have to push with your hand. So we'll put our spaceship on our launcher here. Same spot. Notice it's flying a lot slower than that chapstick did. What we've seen is the same amount of force on a smaller, less massive object means acceleration is faster. Well, this is the biggest and most massive thing we have, so let's see how the acceleration is affected. Pull back the same amount on the force, and here we go. And there you have it. 
have it. Newton's second law of motion in action. Thanks everybody for exploring a little physics with me today. Now I'm gonna send it back to Earth so you can start your experiments. See you again real soon. Okay, time for a space riddle. What has three eyes and swivels? If you guessed Raven, you're right. If you don't know what Raven is, stay with us for this Tech on Deck episode as NASA's Exploration and In Space Services Project Division at the Goddard Space Flight Center explains the technology demonstration payload on the International Space Station that's helping NASA engineers develop an autopilot for spacecraft that may be used in future exploration missions. Did you know there's a three-eyed raven currently perched on the International Space Station? Not an actual bird, but rather a technology payload that is helping NASA develop a relative navigation system, or autopilot, for spacecraft. Launched to station in 2017 aboard a SpaceX Dragon on the company's 10th commercial resupply services mission for NASA, and installed on the outside of ISS by station's Dexter robot, Raven is equipped with three distinct camera vision systems, visible, infrared, and LiDAR. Combined with NASA-developed software algorithms, this rotating module of technology keeps a weather eye on arriving spacecraft. Raven's head, containing its three eyes, or cameras, is always on the swivel, which is made possible by its integral gimbal. Raven is an on-orbit test bed that was built to mature technologies related to um, relative navigation sensors and algorithms. Uh, Raven was launched to the International Space Station aboard a SpaceX Dragon capsule in February 2017. Uh, and it's been operational on the space station since that time. So using three different sensors on Raven uh, that are on a movable gimbal platform, Raven can track the incoming visiting vehicle to station uh, all the way from very, very far, the far away, all the way up to where they dock with the space station. So basically at any given time, Raven can tell you where the incoming visit visiting vehicle is in space relative to the space station and what attitude or pointing direction it is. Raven sends the data it collects from tracking and observing incoming spacecraft to its processor or brain called SpaceCube. This information then tells Raven how it needs to move to continue to track the spacecraft and gauge relative distance and position. NASA engineers have taken what they've learned from multiple Raven observations over the years to adjust and fine tune the relative navigation system as needed so it's ready for the upcoming on-orbit servicing, assembly, and manufacturing one mission, which will robotically refuel a satellite, among other things. Raven is a sensor system that can image an object, process those, process those images on board in real time with advanced algorithms, then calculate the pose of the object relative to itself. These factors come together to create something like spacecraft autopilot. Much like a self-driving car can maintain cruise control based on the speed of the vehicle it follows, two free-flying spacecraft will be able to dock with one another using this technology. Though this operation is similar to the autonomous docking of visiting spacecraft to station, Raven's unique application is necessary for docking two satellites with the challenges of each moving and rotating in every direction during the rendezvous and docking phase. Using that information to then guide the first spacecraft to autonomously rendezvous with and dock with the second spacecraft. So that means finding it in space, aligning with it appropriately, and then bringing the two vehicles together without smashing them into and destroying each of them, all without human intervention. This capability is the kind of thing you need for docking with spacecraft that were not originally designed to be docked with and serviced, which happens to be a vast majority of them. That's why Raven's time on station is critical for the future of on-orbit servicing, assembly, and manufacturing, or OSAM. The OSAM-1 mission will use Raven's relative navigation capability to autonomously, meaning no humans involved, rendezvous and dock with the satellite, and then telerobotically refuel it. 
This will be the first time in history a spacecraft not originally designed to be serviced will be refueled as a means to extend its operational life. Raven is also important for future exploration missions. Raven's technologies can be applied to future NASA missions because if humans want to make a footprint in the solar system beyond low Earth orbit, uh, which is where the International Space Station is located, we're going to have to rely on some form of autonomous docking technologies in the future. Uh, whether it be an unmanned cargo vehicle meeting up in orbit around the moon, uh, refueling tankers located in geosynchronous Earth orbit, or a return vehicle arriving on Mars in advance of a crewed landing, all of these feats will require the technology we're developing with Raven. Using its three eyes, Raven is looking to the moon, Mars, and beyond. Relying on highly robust autonomous systems becomes more crucial the further you move away from Earth as the communications time increase drastically. Once you move past low Earth orbit, it becomes very impossible for humans on Earth to do these highly complex maneuvers in real time. It's more efficient to allow computers to perform these sequences autonomously without human intervention. Although Raven has successfully concluded its main mission objectives, it remains on station. Meanwhile, its team on the ground is using what they've learned to develop more never-before-seen technologies that will enable future space exploration. The International Space Station is not the only NASA mission that's creating benefits for those of us stuck here on the planet. Right now, there are NASA missions measuring water levels in our soil and assessing the impact gravity has on those water levels. All of that generates data from space, which contributes to agricultural production on the ground. Our colleagues from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center have a look at what NASA has to do with irrigation for agriculture and, therefore, the creation of snacks. Welcome to Snack Time with NASA. <laughs> okay. Welcome to Snack Time with NASA. I'm your host, Kathleen Gaeta, and this is my dog, Bowie, and we both really love cheese. So this past year at home, I think we've all learned to appreciate the little things in life, and again, one of those things for us is a nice big cheese board. So today, I'm gonna show you how I like to prepare my own and where NASA actually fits on the board. Many people don't know that NASA has a lot to do with the food on your plate, so we're gonna highlight some of the foods NASA helps grow using data from space. Now, when you think of NASA and dairy especially, you might think of a freeze-dried ice cream for astronauts, but the connection actually goes a lot deeper. So why a cracker and cheese board? When we're talking about food, it all comes down to water. Corn, soy, alfalfa, it all needs water to grow, whether it's being fed to humans or dairy cows. So when farmers are better prepared for a water shortage in advance, they can make more sustainable decisions, like what crops to grow, how to irrigate them, and where and what to feed their livestock. So here to help explain the connection between space and plate is Matt Rodell, NASA hydrospheric scientist. Hey Matt, how's it going? Hey Kathleen, how are you? Thanks for having me. I'm good, thanks for being here. So while I attempt to cube some cheese, can you tell me what NASA has to do with irrigation for agriculture? Absolutely, so, so agriculture requires uh, a nice wet soil for growing crops. In order to know how well the crops are gonna grow, the farmers need to have a better idea of how much water there is in the soil. And so we've been coming up with better ways for monitoring uh, soil wetness from space. Um, one of the ways we do this is we use a, a NASA satellite called SMAP, which is an acronym. And SMAP actually measures the wetness in the top of the soil worldwide um, every day. And this information is vital for understanding how much water is available for the plants, how much water is uh, needed for irrigating the crops. And so it's useful for farmers and land managers and, uh, and others. Um, it's also useful for monitoring drought. Another mission that NASA has uh, is called GRACE, which is another acronym. Um, and GRACE is really incredible because it, it uses measurements of Earth's gravity field to understand the amount of water on and in the land surface. So we can even measure things like the amount of water in the, in the underground aquifers, deep underground. This is vitally important because groundwater is, is one of the main sources of water for agriculture. It's also a source of water for for people who have uh, wells in their backyard like I do. So when I turn the faucet on, that's groundwater coming out. And in fact, about half the produce that we eat, we have groundwater to thank for that because it's used for that much irrigation. This includes things like 
like the wheat in your crackers, uh, soy, fruits and vegetables on your on your platter, etc. So all of these things NASA is doing are really contributing to our understanding of the water availability that's critical for irrigating all these crops. Interesting, and a good reminder that this cheese board needs dressing up. So I have edamame in front of me, and what I believe to be the most underrated part of a cheese board, which are carrots and olives. Yeah, those are pretty uh, water intensive crops, and they're grown in the Central Valley, which is someplace where, where proper water management is really critical. I see you have some grapes there too. Uh, speaking of grapes, uh, NASA has an ongoing project with uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Vintners in California called GrapeX, where we're using data from Landsat satellite along with multiple other uh, space and ground-based observation sources and advanced computer models to help to schedule irrigation for these vineyards and therefore preserve um, the precious resource water. It's really precious in California where there's an ongoing drought right now, um, as well as most of the American West. Um, we use data from, from multiple satellites to monitor drought. Um, this helps the end users like the farmers and the ranchers and, uh, and others that are interested in agriculture to better prepare for drought and to better plan how to, to, uh, to mitigate the effects of drought. Um, drought's gonna become even more important in the future, we believe, with climate change. It's likely that in some parts of the world, droughts are going to become more uh, frequent and more intense and uh, it's possible that the dry parts of the world will get drier, wet parts of the world will get wetter. That's where NASA comes in. So we're helping with not only uh, the current monitoring drought but the forecasting of, uh, of near current drought and then uh, predictions of how climate is going to change in the future and how it's going to affect our water resources. Well Matt it looks like my cheese board's done. What do you think? I think it looks delicious and I can't wait to go start my own lunch. Thanks so much for having me, Kathleen. Thank you for joining me and thank you everyone for watching. I hope you learned a lot. I know I did. And I hope this episode wasn't too cheesy for you. <laughs> okay. Good? If you want another look at any of the stories we showed you today, go on over to YouTube and Facebook at those addresses right there. You'll find them all there, along with lots of other features on a wide variety of NASA topics. And if you're looking for good conversation about human spaceflight, check out Houston We Have a Podcast, our weekly show about all aspects of human spaceflight and NASA's missions of exploration. Today, Gary Jordan zeroes in on the details of the Astro B experiment on the International Space Station and its predecessor experiment, Spheres, to learn how scientists are developing autonomous robots to assist human astronauts on the space missions of the future. Go to nasa.gov slash podcasts for this week's episode and all our previous episodes, plus the full library of all NASA podcasts, which are also on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and SoundCloud. You can get the latest from all over NASA delivered to you every week. Go to nasa.gov slash subscribe to sign up for the NASA newsletter.